Welcome to the Society of Cardiovascular CT's webinar, a technologist's guide to cardiac CT, pre-scan, protocol optimization, and post-scan, sponsored by Siemens Health and Ears. I'm your moderator, Michael Cullinane, a senior clinical support manager for Siemens Health and Ears in CT. Tonight's webinar will feature Dr. Bradley Allen and Sarah Fultnop, the CT coordinator at Northwestern Memorial Hospital in Chicago, Illinois. They have, I have had the pleasure of working with Dr. Allen and Sarah over the last 10 years and truly state they are a wealth of knowledge and have tons of cardiac experience, cardiac CT experience. During tonight's presentation, please feel free to submit your questions via the chat. Dr. Allen and, Dr. and Sarah will be happy to answer your question through the chat room or post presentation, we'll have a live discussion. Thank you, and let's get started. Sarah? Everybody, thank you for joining us. Dr. Allen and myself are going to present a technologist guide to cardiac CT, pre-scan, protocol optimization, and post-scan, all on the Siemens Health and Ears dual source CT scanners. A little bit about myself. My name's Sarah Fatma. I've worked at Northwestern Memorial Hospital for over 17 years. The last four years have been spent in the role of the technical coordinator for the CAT scan department. My main responsibilities are training the new technologists creating and implementing new protocols and workflows across the department and handling all the quality assurance matters. I also monitor our dose tracking software and work in collaboration with others to run our QA program. Here at Northwestern, we have 10 to 12, actually 12 CT scanners, and I work closely with the physicist and the radiologist to maintain high quality, low dose diagnostic imaging for all of our patients. Hi, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Bradley Allen. I'm a cardiothoracic radiologist at Northwestern. Thanks uh, uh, for the opportunity to participate in this in this session. Um, I'm the chief of cardiovascular and thoracic imaging, and as a result of that role, I work very closely with Sarah and our technologist uh, to try to provide uh, you know, best best practices for patient care uh, in our imaging services in cardiovascular and thoracic imaging. I'm also the director of our cardiovascular imaging fellowship, and I have a role in a sort of our Northwestern Medicine system wide uh, standards and protocols for for radiology. Uh, and then finally, I have an academic appointment at Northwestern University. Where I'm an assistant professor for radiology. So we work at Northwestern Memorial Hospital, which is a nationally ranked academic medical center located in downtown Chicago. We're the flagship campus for the Northwestern Medicine System and the primary teaching hospital for the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University. We provide a total of 894 inpatient beds, and we are a comprehensive stroke center and a level one trauma center. You can see here in this picture, this is the Chicagoland area, and all of the purple lights are all of the locations under the Northwestern Medicine umbrella. Here, Northwestern Memorial Hospital is right here by the lake and in downtown Chicago, and it's these five lights right here. Tonight's presentation is going to be about the pre-scan, patient preparation, room readiness, nitro and beta blocker usage, protocols and optimization in the selection of protocols and the criteria for those protocols, and then post-scan, reconstructions, troubleshooting, and how to edit the ECG strip for cardiovascular imaging on the dual source Siemens scanners. We'll start with the pre-scan. So I just wanted to uh, jumpstart the conversation here by talking a little bit about our role on the physician side with sort of patient orders and protocol selection. Most of you I'm sure have seen some type of uh, you know, box like we have on the screen here where it's the order set and usually has something about reason for exam ordering physicians, et cetera. And I just wanna you know, emphasize that on the physician side of things, we spend a lot of time uh, looking at these orders, thinking about these orders, uh, communicating with referring docs to make sure that we're getting the uh, right imaging for the correct patient uh, kind of done you know, in our system in particular in the appropriate location um, in a timely fashion. And, and so that's, that's a big part of of this whole process and and really our goal with this is to try to track the order that we get into one of our protocols which are seen here on uh, this this large list on the right and so that's kind of uh, we try to translate what we have in the reason for exam into some protocol that we that we 
uh, are going to do CT uh, on these patients. And so after Dr. Allen and his team of radiologists have decided what protocol should be used, that will directly correlate and match what's on our scanner. And so here's a screenshot of what is on the scanner. And we decided to have these dedicated protocols match uh, the EPIC order that we use um, so that there isn't confusion with the technologists on what, what they should be doing. And so it does look like a lot of protocols and a lot of these protocols are probably very similar or maybe exactly the same as far as the scanning technology and recons. But there seems to be a lot of confusion about what to pick and what should be done, even amongst the radiologists. So having dedicated protocols to match exactly what you want is, is, is needed for success. And then I wanted to show that we have these a la carte or add-on scans that we started using a couple years ago. And because we are such a large academic center, we do a lot of trial studies and we have a lot of patients that come in with multiple orders, maybe even from multiple providers. So, for example, we might have a patient come in for with orders for a gated aorta and for a coronary. And so we try our best to to combine protocols so that patient only has to come down here one time. And so we found that if. Um, Let's say the radiologist wants a delay scan on a coronary. Instead of having to try to match or combine two different protocols, the technologist can just pick the coronary protocol and then they can go up on here and they can add on a delay gated. And so these add ons are, uh, don't include topograms, they're just series that are easily appended on to the protocol. And so we've optimized these so that they have very similar rotation times to our actual scan. And they might even have some different breathing instructions in here so that we have the least amount of inner scan delay between the two series. But our technologists have found this very, very helpful when they're when they're setting up their protocols. So patient preparation is key to um, having a successful coronary CTA program. So this is really just for the coronary CTAs. We don't necessarily um, do a lot of patient prep ahead of time for our other cardiovascular studies. But we found with coronary CTA that we have success when the when our nurse calls the patient um, about 48 hours prior to the exam. And what they're doing is just communicating to that patient, letting them know what they can expect um, the day of their visit. So we'll let the patients know that they need to be on clear fluids for a few hours prior to the exam, ask them to not have any alcohol or caffeine 12 hours before the exam. We treat all of our coronary CTAs coming in as if we're going to give them beta blockers, and so we don't want them to drive themselves home. So we make sure that they have post scan transportation set up. We also screen the patients for any contrast allergies so that if they are allergic, they have their medication, they know when to take it. And then we also screen for ED medications and give them instructions if applicable. We also screen them for any um, current beta blocker usage. And then we allow the patient time to ask questions or voice concerns. So we find that patients can be very nervous coming in for their scans, and this can lead to increased heart rates or irregular heart rates. So if we found that by having these clear upfront communication with the patient ahead of time, it greatly reduces these irregular heart rates. Along that line, you wanna make sure that you set up your room to create this relaxed, calm environment. It could be things like dimming the lighting in the room, um, making sure everything's clean in the room. We also keep our contrast in the warmer for patient comfort. And so we also get better flow rates from our injectors. I did wanna mention that we do use MedRad Flex injectors and we do utilize their P3T cardiac module. If you're not familiar with this, um, it takes the patient's weight into account and the scan length, and then it tells you what volume and flow rate to use to give you the optimal injection. So we still use biphasic injections with straight contrast and a contrast saline mix to directly follow that for the washout of the right side of the heart. But you wanna make sure that you have your, your contrast loaded when the patient gets in the room, have everything laid out before they get in there. We use gel on our leads. We have a cushion for knees and we give the patient a warm blanket um, because our room does get pretty cold. But having all these things laid out and ready to use creates this calm environment for the patient. You don't want to be running around your room, shuffling through drawers and cupboards. It just it creates this chaos feeling with the patient. The other thing to remember, and we found really, really helpful, is that you practice the breath holds with the patient before you start the exam. 
How many times have you had a patient talk to you after you've told them to hold their breath, asking you, should I hold it now? And it's right as the scan is going. If you give these the patients the instructions ahead of time, then they know what to expect. They know exactly what to do, and they're going to do that same breath hold each time you ask them to do it. And then the other thing is explain very specifically what they can expect, especially regarding the contrast and how warm they're going to get. Anything that you can do to help that patient stay relaxed is going to help their heart rate stay low, and that's key for these type of exams. And then just a little bit about how we use nitro and beta blockers here. Um, we do not have our patients come in pre-medicated with beta blockers. We've decided to keep that all in-house and do it at the time of the scans. And so we can base that on what their heart rate is that day. So the way that we have our workflow set up is the patient arrives in our department and our nurses will take their blood pressure and heart rate as soon as they get in and then um, go to the radiologist to figure out what kind of beta blocker we want to use. So we do have some guidelines set up because we're in an academic center and we have fellows rotating in, in and out every year. We wanted to make sure we had clear, consistent guidelines so that each patient's treated pretty similar, similarly. And I want to say a lot of our goal and standards around this were set up when we implemented and started using heart flow. Heart flow does require or uh, low, low heart rates to get the best um, output. So our goal heart rate for our coronary CTA exams is to have a heart rate at 60 or less. So if a patient comes in with a heart rate between 60 and 65, we're probably going to give them beta blockers, either IV beta blocker on the table or 50 milligrams um, oral beta blocker ahead of time. If the heart rate is 65 or above, almost always we're going to give that patient 100 milligrams of oral beta blocker. And we have our patients come in 90 minutes before we plan to scan them. So we have this built in time to give to give oral beta blocker. So patient will give the get the 100 milligrams. The nurse will start their IV and, and screen them. And then that patient goes and sits in a quiet um, waiting room until their scan until it's time for their scan. Now, when we get them on their table and even after 100 milligrams of oral beta blocker, if their heart rate's still above 60, we will give IV beta blocker on the table. And we'll do this by administering five milligrams every five minutes, up to 15 milligrams. Um, I do want to mention that providing beta blockers in patients with a systolic blood pressure of 90 or less should be avoided and only done at a physician's discretion. And then also keep in mind that severe heart rate fail heart failure patients, so ejection fractions of 30% or less, often are not going to respond to heart rate control. And so a target heart rate of 60 should not be considered. And then all of our coronary CTA studies are going to get nitro unless it's contraindicated. So we have the patient come in and get on the table and we'll immediately drop the sublingual, sublingual 0.4 milligrams of nitro. So that way we can do our topogram and set up our scan. And then when it's time to actually give the contrast and do the coronary CTA, that nitro pills um, disintegrated and taken full effect. One thing uh, I think you'll see with the theme of several of the slides I'm going to present uh, today is the idea of sort of teamwork and communication uh, because we we recognize just how crucial that is in getting really high quality images for our patients. And so this is an example that uh, our group came up with as a team between, you know, Sarah and her her technology team, our nursing staff to really uh, make sure we we have a consistent uh, and sort of easy to follow workflow for inpatient and emergency department patients undergoing coronary uh, CTA. But I just, I, I don't expect you to read every word on this slide, but I think, you know, you can see by the color coding that there's three different groups of people that are involved and it's it's kind of an involved process to, to make the communications back and forth about some of the medication and dosing uh, concepts that Sarah just presented, uh, when the patient actually gets to the scanner, uh, what that looks like, and and um, and that whole process is a lot of itera iteration between the radiologist, the technologist, and the nursing staff. And so communication, teamwork, having that open line of of contact is really crucial to doing this well. So I do want to go over a little bit about gating in the ECG strip on the scanner. 
So I'm sure a lot of you ha know, know this, but if there's anyone out there that doesn't, um, the heart contracts when it's pumping blood. And we're going to refer to this as the systolic phase of the heart, uh, of the heartbeat. And this is where you're typically going to see the most motion artifact on your images. The heart is resting when it's receiving blood, and we refer to this as diastolic. And this is where you're going to see the least amount of motion artifact on your images. So this pumping and resting is visible on the ECG tracing that's on the scanner and in your protocol. Your protocol should be configured according to the part of the heartbeat that you want to visualize. We'll discuss this a little bit more in detail later in, a, in the next few slides. But protocols can be configured using time points that correlate to the heart cycle. And this is either in relative units of 0% or absolute values in millisecond. For today's presentation, I'm mostly going to be referring to the unit of percentage. And so when I refer to something as 0%, that's going to be the start of the R wave and the start of the heartbeat. And then it goes to 100%, which would be the end of that heartbeat and the beginning of the next beat. So it's at the R wave. And so each beat is set up with a range of 0 to 100%. Now, today's presentation and how we scan at Northwestern, we use only dual source CT scanners. And so we have drive and force scanners that we do all of our cardiovascular work on. And the main difference between a dual source and a single source is the time and that rotation of the tubes. So in single source CT, you need 180 degrees of rotation to get an image. And so you're going to get 125 millisecond temporal resolution with the single source CT. Whereas with a dual source CT, you have two tubes rotating around that gantry. And so to achieve that 180 degrees of rotation, you can have each tube only move 90 degrees. And so they only need to move a fourth of a rotation to create an image. And that means that you are able to acquire images in half the time as with a single source CT. And what that means is you're going to get way better temporal resolution with a dual source CT. Between the drive and the force, you're going to get either 66 to 75 millisecond temporal resolution. You also get two times faster scans with the dual source CT. So you're able, able to scan a lot more patients with a dual source CT. And why is that important? Well, it's going to become important when you have heart rates that are 70 and, and above. So when the heart rate exceeds 70 beats per minute, you're going to run into issues with motion artifacts on a single source system because that diastolic phase is too short for the acquisition. That next beat is going to start before your single source CT is able to rotate around. So you can see here in this visual, when the heart rate is under, under 70, it's okay, but after 70, that single source CT is going to take too long to rotate and you're going to be in the next beat and you're going to have motion on your images. And that's what makes the dual source CT so great is that you are able to image patients with very high heart rates and still get images that are clear and have high temporal resolution. We're going to move on to protocol optimization now. And so protocols and scan modes are going to be determined by three different things. Most importantly, it's going to be the indication for the exam. What, um, what are we trying to evaluate? Are we looking at coronary arteries, the valves? Are we looking at the aorta, the pulmonary veins? And then also, what is the indication for the exam? Do you need to see the entire heart cycle? Do you need to see systolic and diastolic time points? That's going to really drive what protocol and scan modes you're going to use. But then also you have to take into account heart rate during the exam. You need to determine what availability you have to heart rate control. Can you can you use beta blockers on your patients? Can you get your heart rates down? And if not, that's going to drive the scan mode that you're going to use. And then also it's determined by the radiologist and what they're willing to interpret. How high a quality of images do they need to be able to make that diagnosis? And then the last thing to consider is radiation dose. There is quite a bit of difference in, in radiation dose between the different modes that that we have options to, and I'll go over that a little bit further in the next few in the next few slides. And you have to determine your patient population. Do you have pediatric patients or do you have adult adult patients? So you're going to want to work closely with the radiologist, your lead technologist, and your physicist to really determine um, radiation dose optimization in the different scan modes. But the next few slides, we're going to go over the the three main types of scan modes available on the dual source Siemens scanners. And those are retrospective, which is radiation on during the entire exam, 
prospective where radiation is turned on and off for every beat and then the flash mode which is a high pitch scan that covers just one heartbeat um we'll start with retrospective and retrospective scan mode is a spiral scan and you will have radiation on during the entire duration of your of your scan and you're going to cover several different heartbeats um, as you cover the whole heart and within this mode you do have the capability to ramp your radiation up and down and you are able to display images from any point in the heart cycle so you are going to be acquiring images from zero to 100 percent of every beat and then you're going to be able to retrospectively go back and edit the ECG tracing after the exam. And this comes into play with, with motion and irregular heartbeats. You're going to want to use this mode when your patients have higher variable heart rates. And you'll want to use this when you want to evaluate cardiac function so that you have all cycles of the heartbeat in there. And you'll definitely want to use this mode when you want to see the heart during different time points. Within retrospective mode, there's a couple options as well. So the most robust is your pulsing off, meaning you're going to have radiation on full blast the entire heart cycle across all of the beats during the entire exam. You can see here, this is taken off the scanner. This is your ECG strip. This light purple area shows you where radiation is on, and that is fully on during the whole time. And this is really important when you have high and variable heart rates or when you're trying to image things like the valve. So you'll want to use this mode when for your TAVR studies or your other valve studies, because you're going to want to be able to see that valve in every phase of the heartbeat. The benefits of this is that you can decide after the scan is acquired where you want to display the images. What time point of that heartbeat do you want to display the images? And you can do it from any point. And you can obtain multiple image sets from different different time points and then you're going to be able to go in there and, and edit this ECG strip if needed when you have irregular heartbeats. Um, the drawback to this is that it is the highest radiation dose to the patient. Within retrospective mode, you can use pulsing and you would use this to reduce radiation and there's a couple options here. You can do the manual pulsing and that actually ramps your radiation dose all the way down to 20%. And you can see this in the light purple shaded area right here. So this right here is fully on 100% radiation and then ramps down right where the heart's beating, where you're gonna have a lot of motion anyway. And then it'll ramp back up when you get here into the diastolic or the when the heart's the stillest. Um, you would want to use this mode again for variable and high heart rates and, and you can still evaluate function even though the scanner is ramping up and down. It has the same benefits of, of the pulsing off. It's just going to offer you less radiation to the patient. Now the drawback to this is that it is still higher radiation than your prospective or flash modes but it is a little bit less than having that pulsing completely off. And your image quality where it is ramped down will be slightly decreased on these next this next slide you can see here this is an image that was a taken out of a time point where the radiation was ramped down and you can see that you can still have you still have quite a bit of diagnostic value to this but this is compared to when radiation is fully on and you can see that's much clearer there and this was taken right where the radiation was ramped all the way up Another pulsing option in the retrospective mode is to do min dose manual, and that's going to bring your radiation all the way down to 4%. And you can see this light, lightly shaded area that this the radiation stays on the whole time, but is significantly ramp, ramped down. And this is going to really reduce your radiation dose. So you can st you'll still want to use this mode for variable and high heart rates, and you can still evaluate function in in this min dose manual, even though it's ramped down so far. So the benefits of this mode are going to be very similar to your other retrospective options. Um, you can get multiple image data sets from different time points. You can edit the ECG. You can still get ejection fraction from outside of the trigger range here where it's ramped down. And the drawback to this is it's still going to be more radiation than a prospective or flash mode. Um, and your image quality is then going to be even more decreased out when, when it's ramped down. Um, here's an example of an image that's being displayed from when radiation was ramped all the way down. So quite a bit grainier, not as clear, but there's still information here. And then 
this is that same image pulling the information from when we had full radiation on. Moving on to the prospective mode. Prospective mode is actually a sequential scan. So your radiation is gonna be completely turned off and on after each beat and the table will move. You have to decide what trigger range or where you want radiation on before you scan. And so radiation will be turned off outside of your range completely. And the scan is gonna occur over several heartbeats. You can use this protocol for patients that have very low or regular heart rates. You can use this when you wanna evaluate coronary arteries. You um, will wanna use this when you, when you don't need to analyze function. And it's definitely can be used when you want a lower radiation dose option for your patient. The benefits of prospective scanning is that it allows you to acquire images during one to several time points of each heartbeat. Again, you have to decide that up front, but you do have the capability of having a range and having multiple options to pull data out of. Um, you can acquire images only during diastole when the heart rates are low and steady, and this is gonna be low radiation dose for your patient. But you also have the ability to acquire images during diastole and systole when the heart rates are a little bit higher and you might want some more options, and you would just do that by changing your scan range. So our typical coronary CTA prospective mode is just gonna image during diastole. So we set our range to 65 to 75. But if we have a patient whose heart rate's kind of creeping up, but we don't want to necessarily go to a retrospective mode, we just open up this range to 35 to 75, and that will extend how long the, the tube is on, and then you can grab images from any time point within there. The drawback to prospective mode, though, is that you cannot edit the ECG strip afterwards. So if you do have an ectopic beat or the heart rate suddenly changes, you're not able to edit the ECG strip. Um, and then you're also, you're not able to go back and get images outside of your, out of the preset range. So you can see here, the light purple area is the scan range that we've set up and you can get data anywhere in here. The dark purple line is just where the current series is pulling the data from. And then the last mode is the flash mode, also referred to as high pitch mode. And this is on only on the dual source scanners. Flash modes acquired only during one heartbeat and it's scanned with a very high pitch. So on the force scanner, you'll get a you'll have a pitch of 3.2, and on the drive scanner, it'll be a pitch of 3.4. And you can use this mode when the heart rates are low and steady, when you want very low radiation dose. And you can use this mode for other cardiovascular studies like gated aortas and pulmonary veins and calcium scoring. And it can be used for coronary CTA, but you're gonna wanna make sure that heart rate is very low and steady. So the dual source scanners are able to acquire this because they have such high or fast table speeds. So this table speed, 400 millimeters per second, it can cover 12 centimeters and less than 300 milliseconds. So this is what allows you to be able to do a flash mode for coronary CTA. Um, the table speeds on the drive are 458 millimeters per second and on the force it's 737 millimeters per second. Um, the benefit of flash mode, again, is very low radiation dose. So if you use 100 kV, your dose will be less than one millisievert for a coronary, and you are going to get images just from one heartbeat. The drawback, again, like I said, is that um, you are only able to display the one image set. You're not going to be able to have multiple phases of the heart and display it in, in, different, in different phases. And with this high pitch mode, you will have limited field of view. Um, there's no, you'll max out at the field of view and not be able to get like your extended field of view. So this mode isn't, isn't good for all patients. And so you do have to be very selective on when you use this. The other thing I wanted to mention here is that you will want to make sure if you're going to use this mode to have your, your scan start early enough in the cardiac phase that it doesn't overlap with the next heartbeat. Otherwise, you're gonna get motion on your, on your images. And that set up in the background, it's actually, you're not able to change that on the fly during the exam. So you wanna be very careful on how you set these protocols up and maybe have a couple different ones for different heart rates.
So I just kind of wanted to break this down with the different scan modes and then the protocols that you would use. So for flash mode, you can do protocols like your calcium score, your coronary arteries. Again, it's a certain patient population in the, and you want to have low and steady heart rates. You can use it for your gated aortas, your pulmonary veins. We do a lot of um, pre-workups for the watchman procedure. So we have a watchman protocol that uses the flash mode. The prospective mode, is what we predominantly use for our cardiac coronary CTAs when the heart rates are good. And then I will say we do have a gated aorta protocol that uses the prospective mode for larger patients. So like I had mentioned before, in the flash mode, you do have a limited field of view. So when we get larger patients and we need a bigger field of view, we'll actually use the prospective mode. And then your retrospective mode is going to be used for morphology studies, your art coronary artery studies with high heart rates your TAVR studies, and then any of your other valve studies that you do. And then your, your scan modes, I kind of wanted, wanted to break this down on how you base it based on the heart rate. So heart rates at 60 or less, the flash mode, the flash coronary mode is going to be optimal for you for most of your patients. We, ha we haven't pulled the trigger and, and just automatically started doing low heart rates with flash. It's uh, kind of a case by case scenario with the tech sees that the heart rate's under 60 and it's a, a thinner patient that we know we're going to get good images on. They'll check with the radiologist and say, hey, is this a candidate for the flash? And we started using it more and more and been really, really happy with the way the scans have been turning off or turning out. Um, we do have the radiologist check the images afterwards because we don't have the ability to get multiple phases of the heart rate and we don't have the ability to edit the ECG. We want to make sure those the images are good and that the patient wouldn't have to come back. Um, and then if heart rates between 60 and 85 are going to be great with perspective mode. And then once the heart rate gets into the 80s, 85 and above, we'll almost always flip over to a retrospective mode so that we have the ability to edit the ECG strip and that we can get systolic and diastolic images. I wanna mention, and something that we started using a, a year or two ago is the cardiac auto. And so our protocols, most of our protocols are built with cardiac auto. So in the scan box here, you choose auto. And what that's going to do is the scanner is actually going to determine your trigger range, the scan range, based on the heart rate at the time of the scan. If the heart rate fluctuates just before the scan, like which is pretty common when you give contrast, the heart rate tends to creep up. If that heart rate were to creep up to a certain extent or become variable, then the scanner is going to automatically open up this trigger range to the 35 to 75 percent so that we do get systolic and diastolic images. And then we have our recon set to auto as well. And so depending on what the heart rate is, it's either going to do a best diastolic or a best systolic recon phase. Well, what this has done is it's eliminated the need to make any changes on the fly. It's taken the responsibility off the technologist to catch it and try to change something. And then it's also eliminated us having to call the radiologist every time that heart rate changes just slightly with the patient on the table. But we're, we're relying on the scanner to kind of make those decisions for us. And, and it's been really, really successful and works really, really well. Um, you are able to set up the parameters for this cardiac auto, and it's set up in the, in the background. And the scanners come with defaults, and the defaults work quite well. I think our set these are our settings that I pulled. I think they're very similar to the to the Siemens defaults. But for an example, if you're if your patient stays with a low heart rate and it's regular, um, the trigger range is going to stay at 65 to 75 percent. And it's going to display the images in a best diastolic recon phase. Now if we give contrast and the heart rate starts jumping up and it gets really high but stays regular, it's just going to open up the trigger range to 35 to 75 percent. And then it's going to display the images in the best systolic phase. You even have the ability on the scanner to set up what you want to consider a low, moderate, and high heart rate and what you consider a regular, unstable, or rhythmic heartbeat. Again, these come with defaults and they work pretty good. I think we only altered ours just a little bit, but you do have the ability to really tailor it to your institution and to what your radiologists prefer. And then just a couple other automation tools that are offered on the Siemens scanner is the fast planning. So basically what this is gonna do is you set this in your protocol 
And once the topogram is taken, it will set up your scan box and your recon boxes to what you want it to. So this would be a chest protocol and you tell it you want it to be set up to the lung field. This box will automatically pop up over the lung. This just reduces the time the tech is spending setting up the scan and the recons. And then there's fast adjust, which is just a single click protocol adjustment. And so when you get your larger patients on the table and the scanner's wanting you to maybe change your MAS or your scan time, instead of the technologist trying to figure out, they just click this adjust button and it's automatically done for them. And then the last automation tool is Care KB, which we utilize on almost all of our protocols. And so what you do in the background is just set up what KB range you want. And then you also set up what type of exam you're doing if it's an angio or if it's a liver, a non-contrast or an MSK, the scanner is then going to determine for you which KV is optimal. So this is great for the for the smaller patients where you really don't need 120 KV. You can get away with 100 or maybe even 80 KV. So this has been really great and it provides consistency for the technologist and then optimization for the radiologist. Okay, and we're going to move on to what happens after the scan, the post scan. So I just want to go through briefly here what we send uh, to to PACS for our our uh, cardiovascular exams here, particularly our cardiac exams. Uh, and I think maybe more important than than the discrete uh, series that we send over and review. I think the point to make here is really uh, this needs to be tailored to every individual practice. Uh, so you know the radiologists who are reading these cases have to interact with the technologist uh, to to come up with the the uh, reconstructions that they need. Uh, to you know, make whatever diagnosis they're trying to make. Uh, but then the other side of that is you don't want to send stuff that you don't need uh, because that's from our perspective, that's more images to look at, uh, potentially you know, uh, wasting time or spending more time than is necessary, and also perhaps increasing liability uh, in some respect. So it's a balance of what you uh, finding exactly what you need uh, in these reconstructions. The other consideration here, and it's something I think we're starting to work through more uh, at Northwestern, is with modern uh, PACS uh, environments, uh, the software has the ability to, to do a lot more reconstructions uh, on the fly. Uh, and so it becomes a question of, do you send more of, you know, quote, raw data uh, and, and do your own reconstructions or have the data there? to reconstruct uh, as needed uh, versus sending some of these manuals. So it's really a, a something that has to be worked out as a group, I think, uh, to figure out what's optimal. But this is what we use and, and it, it works really well for us. And then a couple things to mention with your recons. If you have patients with pacemakers or metal artifact, um, you wanna make sure that you have recons with IMAR on. And so if you're not familiar with IMAR, it's the iterative metal artifact reduction um, software that Siemens offers. And they have different settings. So depending on what kind of metals present, if it's a neural coil, dental filling, a pacemaker, et cetera, um, you can either have preset recons built with it or you can add on IMAR to any recon that you have in within the protocol. And it's just done here with this IMR button. The example here on the bottom is a pacemaker. So this this first image here on the left is without IMR. It's just the source data. And then the image on the right is after we applied the pacemaker IMR filter. And so you can see how much it cleaned up that metal artifact around it. You can use IMR in the extended field of view as well. And the other thing that Siemens has on their scanner is this um, automatic cardiac reconstruction or cardio best phase. So when you're going through the images, it can take, without using any automation, it could take you up to seven or 10 minutes to kind of sift through the different phases and decide which, you know, which, which phase looks best for each vessel. Or you can use the cardiac cardio best phase, and you can do this for both systolic and diastolic. So you set that up in your protocol to do the best phase, and then a scanner is going to decide for you and then recon the images automatically in that phase. You still have the ability to choose what you want, but this is going to cut down, cut down the time significantly. And usually we use what best phase is picked for us. If you don't like the best phase, or maybe 
um, your RCA looks good, but your LAD, di LAD didn't. You do have the ability to quickly preview one slice at several different phases. And so you would first just identify an image where a coronary artery may not look the best or maybe has what looks like motion on it. So for the example here, you might be looking at your RCA and, and think this isn't the, the best phase to look at it. You can preview then this same slice at several different phases by using this preview series. And you can set it up to show you whatever you want. You could have it show you different milliseconds or percentages. We typically do zero to 100 in the percentages. And so you hit this preview series and then it's gonna show you the same slice thickness at different phases. And so you clearly see here at 60%, the RCA is looking way better. And also at 70%, then you know that you would just recon in those, in those phases. So the, probably the most important thing to consider and what we try to really impress upon our trainees as they're, um, as they're just getting started and as they go through our program is that the quality of our imaging it, it directly impacts diagnosis. It's kind of that old saying uh, that people talk about garbage in, garbage out. Really, uh, you know, what Sarah and her team do and what they provide us, it, it directly impacts what we're able to do for the patient. So it's really important, I think, for as, on the physician side for us to understand, um, you know, what are the source of some of the problems that we may see when the images don't look great and at least know uh, when we have an opportunity to maybe improve those by some of the techniques there has shown us here. And so some of the things that we teach our folks to look for and that, that I look for, you know, in every one of these cases are, are there respiratory motion or arrhythmia artifacts that are clearly impacting my ability to make a diagnosis? And some of the stuff that has come out of, of looking at that carefully or some of the, you know, breath hold instruction uh techniques that sarah described earlier you know kind of how how we coach our patients you know that's kind of been directly impacted by understanding that was hurting our quality in some um, some cases you know appropriate uh choice of retrospective prospective flash mode obviously uh will impact quality and it and um you know is again driven by uh, a lot of different factors that everybody on the team has to kind of have a handle on and then there are key trouble spots that you know tend to tend to crop up in all these exams uh sarah mentioned the rca the right coronary artery that's that's a big big issue on a lot of patients uh, and so we end up having to really pay close attention to that and understand um you know uh, if if what we have sent to us initially isn't good enough in that region how we can fix it uh, the other area that we tend to run into occasionally is the left main LAD kind of there's a portion of it that's a little bit more uh, transverse in the patient and that can also be impacted uh, by respiratory motion in particular. Uh, and then the other thing we've we've uh, run into from time to time is uh, clipping the inferior aspect of the heart. So, you know, it's going back and, and looking at uh, where the field of view was set up and, and you know, coaching the technologist as needed to to make sure that we're not clipping the inferior aspect of the, part, the heart, which would, which can be um, easy to do in some uh, cases. So I think uh, just the open lines of communication uh, saying, here we see this problem. Is there anything we can do about it uh, now? Uh, is it a problem that needs to be addressed in a more QI or QA standpoint? Uh, and for this particular patient, um, do we need to rescan? Those are the decisions that we have to make uh, as we initially review the the images for quality. Um, yeah, that's great. I agree. So when the, you know, the radiologists come up, find something, and they'll come to me with it, and then we definitely we look at, is it something we can fix, or is it something that we need to coach on? And so um, I'll reiterate that that open line of communication is really key between the radiologists and the, and the technologists. Um, just to go over a few common things that we see and kind of how to troubleshoot and fix, um, fix, is uh, the misaligned image data. So images can appear to have motion. Um, they might look fine on your axial stack, but when you throw it into a 3D or a coronal NPR, you, you might see this misaligned data, the stair step effect, right? So if you find an image like this, 
doesn't necessarily mean the patient needs to come back and be rescanned, right? It might be as simple as just trying to reconstruct in a different phase. So this one was reconstructed at negative 400 millisecond. And so you can see down here at negative 400 on the ECG strip, we're kind of right over this wave right here. And so it could just be some cardiac motion that we're seeing here. So the simplest thing to try first is just reconstruct in another phase and move it, move it by 100. So move it to negative 500 millisecond. And by doing that, you come off of this wave and you come right here into the heart of the diastolic phase. And you can see how much clearer that image is and you've lost that stair step effect. So instead of rescanning the patient, you just reconstructed what you already had and now you have a diagnostic scan. Just a little bit more about picking a different phase and how to kind of troubleshoot that. Um, irregular heart rates are gonna be problematic, right? And especially when you're trying to achieve motion-free images and you want to display those images in a 3D or an NPR view. So volumetric alignment is difficult because the time between the R and R waves is gonna vary when you have a heart rate that varies. So a faster heart rate is gonna have a short, shorter R to R time and, and slower heart rates are gonna have a longer R to R time. And so when you are telling the scanner to display an image at a certain time point, it's gonna do that for every beat, but that beat is not gonna line up from, from each heartbeat. So for example, if you tell the scanner to display your images at 70%, it's gonna count forward from zero. So on this heartbeat, it's gonna be fine. But then on this next heart heartbeat where maybe it dropped a little bit and you have a longer R to R wave distance, the image data is gonna be displayed from a different location. And then it goes back to the, the same heartbeat. And so your, your images aren't gonna line up and you're gonna get that stair step effect. The same thing if you do positive milliseconds. So you're counting forward from zero. So if you were to tell the scanner to do 700 millisecond, it's gonna, on this heartbeat right here, take images from right here. And then on the next heartbeat where it slowed, where the heart rate slowed down a little bit, your images are actually gonna be pulled from right here. And this is quite a bit different location than it is from here, sorry. Now, if you do the negative millisecond, so your absolute value, and you count backwards from the end of the heartbeat, you're actually gonna line up your image data more similarly across each heartbeat. And you can see the going negative millisecond here, it's gonna be almost in the same location as the next heart rate, even though it was a different heartbeat. Now we'll move on to like, to editing ECG, the, the editing the ECG strip. And so you'll wanna do this when you have ectopic beats or variable heart rates, and you have three options. You can disable syncs, which is just gonna take that data away and eliminate it from the image reconstruction. And you can do this both in relative or absolute units. So you can do this both in percentages or milliseconds. You have the option to delete syncs. So that's gonna completely delete that data. And you have to be in the absolute or the millisecond to do that. Um, I will say we don't do a lot of deleting syncs. We really just stick to disabling the syncs. And then you do have the option to insert a sync. And you can do this either in the absolute or the percentage, but Siemens does recommend that you're in absolute or milliseconds to do this. And this is just gonna add an artificial R peak to your data and pull more data in. Um, so we're gonna review just a couple different scenarios and I'll let Dr. Allen kind of explain the images that he saw and, and what he needed from the technologist. So, in this particular case, uh, this is a coronary CTA. And so uh, even without looking at the axial coronals, if we are, uh, if we were, sorry, without looking at the coronals or sagittal reconstructions, if you scroll through this, you would notice, and uh, we don't have the ability to do that, sorry. Uh, you would notice that uh, this is not gonna be diagnostic at multiple levels uh, in the coronary arteries where we have to be quite precise, uh, as you can imagine, uh, when we're thinking about uh, coronary artery disease, coronary artery stenosis in, in these patients. Uh, and so what we've found to be really effective is when you notice that, that almost the first thing that I do uh, is I pull up the sagittal uh, images to get a sense for what the actual problem with the artifact is. And in this case, you can see there's just basically sort of, uh, you know, this this 
region of data, these set of slices are sort of just uh, stretched out. There's not actually much information uh, available in there that's usable. And so the way this would work in practice is um, me or the fellows or one of our other attendings would, would see this. And this is when you say, is this an artifact that we can fix or not? And, and that's, that's kind of the moment that we call Sarah or her team or go to the scanner and say, here, we've got this, we see it. Can you help us fix it? Uh, because if not, then we're going to have to call this patient back or rescan the patient. Yep. So then when we see this and we see this blurring artifact, the first thing we're going to try or that we're going to try is to add some information to this because we're missing information. And so what you want to do is you want to scroll through your axial images until you reach this point. And you're going to note what image slice number that is because that image slice number can directly correlate to the ECG strip, right? So this, this number that you see up here is the image slice number. So if this image to start this blurring was around 200 or so, and the image down here where the blurring kind of ends was around 300 or so, we know we need some more data in between those two. So what we do would be to add sinks. So we would add a sink after the first beat and after the second beat. And by doing that, this is that same patient that's at the same location, we've cleared up all of that blurring artifact. And now we have a diagnostic scan and that patient doesn't have to come back. We just did a, a little bit of ECG editing and a couple new reconstruction jobs. And, and it's so important, the, the our ability to do this because one, the inconvenience for the patient, but also, you know, this is radiating a patient. I think this particular patient was a younger patient. So, I mean, we, you know, it, it really matters to take the time to try to do this as opposed to just say, oh, uh, it's unusable, call the patient back. I think it's it's a really great service to our patients. Yep, yep. And it literally took the technologist five minutes to do this. So it's definitely doable and easy. This is uh, just another case. Sorry, Sarah, uh, just to jump in. This is actually a TAVR CT. And, and the whole point of TAVR is to, uh, you know, be able to accurately measure the valve uh, plane. And so these are retrospective scans. Um, and we spend a lot of time and a lot of manpower uh, really trying to accurately measure the aortic annulus, coronary heights, and everything like that. So a scan that looks like the what you see on the left where there's blurring there is really not going to be acceptable for a TAVR patient. And so again, when we see this blurring, pull up a, you know, a sagittal view and you start to say, okay, is this something we can is this something we can fix? And it's at that moment, you know, that we call call Sarah and team and say, here's what we've got. How can you help us uh, work through this? Yep, yep. So, yeah, when we get this call and we're looking at this, we might first step would probably be just to reconstruct it in a different phase or two. If that doesn't work and it didn't in this case, then we start looking at the ECG strip and what how we can edit it. And when you see this blurring artifact, you know there's too much data, right? You have conflicting data here. So our first step then after after trying to recon in a different phase would be to take out some information. So this is where we're going to disable a sink. And again, you're going to approach it with the same um, thought process. Sorry, <laughs> um, I'm trying to scroll through the images, <laughs> which we can't do here. Um, You'll scroll through these axial images until you see where this motion starts, and you're gonna note what image slice number that is. You're gonna correlate that to your ECG, ECG strip so you know exactly which beat to disable. And then it's a right click at the scanner, disable the sync, and hit reconstruct. And then you get these images here, which are completely diagnostic, and you're able to see the aortic root very clearly and get the measurements that are needed. And then you don't have to call the patient back. Um, so yeah, those those were the example cases we wanted to give to you. Um, hopefully you found some value out of this and enjoyed the presentation. And um, yeah, we're happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Sarah and uh, Dr. Allen. That was fantastic and really very good and explained very well. Appreciate it very much. Um, I was watching the uh, chat while we were going through the whole presentation, and it looked like we had answered pretty many of the questions. Um, there was one or two that I did notice. Uh, one of them was regarding the heart rate, or excuse me, the, the, uh, the, the pound. Do you have a cutoff limit for a patient's weight limit? Uh, 
We really don't, but I have to say we don't scan a lot of patients over 400 to 450 pounds. Um, not sure, Dr. Allen, if you've seen larger patients than that. I don't know that we necessarily don't scan them. I just don't think that we've done a lot. Thank you. I think that was one. Um, the other question uh, was regarding contrast. Um, because you're taking pictures of the heart at different segments, the contrast changes its density from the beginning towards the end of the CT scan. Does that cause a problem um, as a, an artifact or is there some way around fixing that? Do you want to take that, Dr. Allen? Do you know? Sorry, I'm sorry, yeah. I missed it. I was having some some tech issues there with uh, getting getting my mic and uh, camera to work. So, can, sorry, can you just repeat it real fast, Mike? Uh, yes, one of the one of the uh, questions were the contrast media, where um, you're scanning in a sequential mode, prospectively, and as you're scanning the heart, the contrast density changes from one area of the scan to the bottom of the heart. Let's say, um, is there is that an artifact, true artifact that can be corrected or is there something that can be done to uh, mitigate that type of uh, uh, image um, presence? So there's nothing really, uh, I think after the scan has been acquired that could correct that type of an artifact. I think kind of you get what you get once the contrast is in is, and has been scan uh, scanned. The way to make sure that you avoid that is really to plan your contrast timing uh, ahead of time. And so we, certainly think very carefully about contrast bolus timing, depending on the type of scan that we're, that we're going to perform and that's built into our protocols. Uh, and so that's really the way to try to prevent that. And then of course, the way that you sort of dilute your contrast over the course of the, the bolus as well, uh, all plays into how to, to, to make sure you optimize sort of enhancement from that standpoint. Um, so it's really a, a more upfront. And then I would also say it's a learning curve as well. If you have a scan where you have something like that, you know, think about what parameters you used, how you triggered, where you triggered off of um, to, to sort of get it a little bit better on the next one. Thank you. Um, I believe one of the other questions in the chat that I had seen was, do you know the percentage of prospective scans versus like flash scans? Uh, compared to maybe a retrospective scan. So understanding that the, all the valve type studies will be retrospective of some sort. So excluding those for coronary CTA specifically. Yeah, I, I don't have the exact numbers on that, um, but I, I would say and I would say roughly it's probably about 80-20 uh, prospective. That would be a rough estimate. And uh, I think as Sarah mentioned in the slides, since we've been working carefully with heart flow, uh, a big part of what we have to pay attention to is really image optimization for these coronary CTs. And so as a result of that, we may have gone up a little bit on our use of, um, of retrospective scanning, but it's still probably in that 80 to 20 range. Fantastic. Um, I do not see any other additional questions in the, uh, the chat. Um, I do, from Siemens Health and Ears, thank both of you very much for uh, presenting this through the SCCT's uh, help. And um, with that, I think that we can close up tonight's educational webinar. Thank you, SCCT, and all of the participants that have joined. Great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for joining, everybody.